Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Ease 1. In the last part, we continued our way up through Darm Tower, made our way over halfway through it, and now we're actually going to go finish off the game. But before we move on, as you can see there, I finished off the bestiary entries for the two enemies on that previous mirror maze floor, and now we're continuing onwards over here to find the strongest shield in the game, the Battle Shield. Well, sort of the strongest. Uh, I'll get more into why during the final boss, but uh, th there's something this game pulls. I'm not the biggest fan of, even though I get why it's that way narratively, and it involves uh, the final tier of equipment. So this floor in particular has two pathways you can go on, and we want to go on one rather than the other, because last time, Luda and Raba said they saw some girl get dragged off towards Rado. Was it Annex, or is it Rado? Something like that. And this is the pathway that leads there. You do need to go there before the end of the game, because... Well, of course, just make sure you're ready, but to be thankful at least, they do give you this little bridge section here you can still regenerate on. Uh, it's also one of my favorite screens in the game, although it eerily reminds me of a screen of Chrono Trigger. Rado's Annex isn't that big or long or dangerous of an area, except for one thing at the very end of it, and it's the major puzzle for the area. Now, I forget how you're supposed to learn the solution to this, like going back to talk to Raba again, or going even further down and talking to Gemma or Dogi again. But here on this very unique looking screen, at the top of it is a very evil looking door. I forget what happens if you touch it, I think you just get bounced off of it, otherwise it does kill you. But it will only open to people with an evil heart. We got an evil ring much earlier in the tower, but like I said back then, if you equip that evil ring, you die instantly. Unless you're wearing the blue necklace. In which case, you can put on the evil ring, and you will survive no problem, and you can open the door. Just make sure you put the necklace on before the ring, and to take it off immediately, just so you don't forget. Oh, Adol. It's me, Rhea, the Troubadour. Do you remember? I had faith that you would come. I let myself be captured. I knew no other way to find you, and there was something I had to tell you. It's in regards to the man who ultimately locked me in this room. His name is Dark Fact. He's a fearsome man of ill intent who wears a jet black cape to intimidate those around him. He means to use the power of the monsters to exercise control over all of Asteria. He may even aspire to conquer the entire world. Adol, you possess the Books of Ease, do you not? Should Dark Fact acquire those books, the world would suffer consequences most dire. Please, you must somehow put a stop to his evil ambitions. Very few people in the world are capable of reading the Books of Ease anymore. You, more than any, have earned the right to do so. Please, take this with you. It'll grant you the power to read the ancient language of Ease. And we got the monocles. Now we can equip this and actually use the Books of Ease as items in order to read them. When you have read all six of the books, the full scope of the legend shall become known. At all, please, uncover the truth. So, the way it works, just put on the monocle, then put on any of the Books of Ease, and you can read them with the button you use to use things like the potions. You can read the first three volumes again if you want to for whatever reason, but the main thing we want to read now is the two volumes we found while we have been in the tower. First off, we have the Book of Mesa. We have finally found ourselves cornered in the Temple of Solomon. The six great demons dog our every step and will be upon us soon. We have decided to leave this land for now, and hope that we may one day return. Take heed, O divided peoples, for grievous times loom upon all paths of the future. But do not lose hope, for time has decreed that a guide shall come. O peoples, still your laments. And now for Book 5. The Book of Gemma. He came, bringing his demon hordes with him, and amidst our darkest terrors the goddesses disappeared. They have not been seen hence. Have we been forsaken? We of the line of Gemma know an ancient story. It speaks of an amulet made of a translucent blue crystal. This amulet, the story says, has the power to destroy the demon's dreaded curses. Take note, however, of the weight that time has wrought upon this tale. Proceed with wisdom, for there is danger. Hmm. We know the name Gemma. In fact, we already know the books are somewhat ancestral because Sarah Tova had the Book of Tova, who we then had her aunt read. So before we actually progress higher up in the tower, what you really want to go do in order to actually, you know, finish the game, 
is go take this book back to Luta, where we found him injured last time. This is a little bit of a backtrack that's kind of annoying, yes, but because of how condensed the floors of the Darm Tower are, it doesn't take too long. I am still going to speed it up just so it doesn't take as long as it could. Though the main reason I'm actually speeding this up is so you can see the route through the mirror maze coming from above instead of below, since you do need to actually find your way through it both ways, which is kind of annoying, but again, it doesn't take that long at all. If memory serves, I sped this footage up by five times to do this, so this is about 20 seconds, so it took about two minutes in total. The girl is safe? Oh, thank goodness. It's really quite odd. I've never met that girl before, yet I'm absolutely terrified for her. Wait, is that... Why do you have the Book of Gemma? That's my family's ancestral album. I lost it when I was a little boy, and I've always wondered where it may have gotten to. Back then, my father told me something. He said the one who found all six books of ease would be granted the power to bring peace to Hysteria. At all, this is another ancient heirloom passed down to my family, and I'd like for you to have it. And now we have the Blue Amulet! My leg is a bit worse than I previously thought. I think I'll stay here in safety and rest for a bit longer. I'll be fine. You have to go, right? Don't you worry about me. Once my leg stops throbbing, I'll make my way out of here. Alright, so we just have to leave him once again, but we have the blue amulet now, which we actively need in order to grab something coming up, so make sure you actually get it. And now I'm just going to speed our way back up. I think this once again took about two minutes in total. I, I think if you actually... Like, after all the boss fights are done, walk from start to finish in the Tower of Darm. You can be done in like six minutes if you know the exact routes and don't need to go get all the treasure chests. It isn't that long of an area. It's just there's a lot of little side things you have to go along the way, including going to save Rhea, finding Raba and all that. Not to mention the backtracking up and down because of the prison in order to find Raba the first time. So you might remember back during, I think it was the lower floors of the Solomon Shrine before the Centipede boss fight. I was talking about how I don't like how the latter half of especially Ease 1 has a lot of, like, one-tile pathways. The latter, like, eight floors of Darm Tower, especially this floor, Floor 17, are very guilty of that because these Kelmarls spawn so quickly. And it's just a case where you just have to kind of eat the damage while hitting them yourself because you literally don't have a way to get around them. Or at the least, that's a problem more so in this version of Ease 1 and 2. Uh, because in these versions, you bounce backwards a little bit, so you will just hit the same enemy from the front several times in a row. Which can be helpful in some cases, but not so much in the single-tile hallway areas. In older versions of Ease 1, you would often just basically clip into the enemy hitbox, so you could walk right through them, essentially, if you hit them enough times. But that also led to the problem of you potentially getting trapped in their hitbox and getting hit from behind, and that just didn't feel great. I do think this version, with its bump back, is ultimately for the better, but there's cases where it could have been done better. Selmargs aren't an annoying enemy on their own, or at all really, but they are an enemy that almost caused me to not complete the bestiary on this particular playthrough, because when I check my notes in a moment, if you look carefully, you notice I'm actually missing one stat. I think I forgot to kill like two extra ones. I still get them before the end of the LP, uh, because this was actually the first time I had maxed out all the bestiary stuff, uh, at least in this particular file. So, I didn't get the achievement when I maxed out all the other normal enemies, so I had to look through my bestiary and see what I missed, and I had a real big panic attack when I was thinking it may have missed something before Darm Tower. And now that I know all my save files from that point are erased, that would have been doubly bad. Oh god, another trap! But thankfully, this one's very generous. It just warps you slightly downwards from where we just were. So, like the teleportation trap that we had to get past that ultimately led to us meeting Dogi, Equip the blue necklace, and you won't get teleported backwards five steps. I mistakenly put on the blue amulet at first, because I was just looking for the color blue, I wasn't exactly reading. And in here we have the strongest armor in the game, the battle armor. And with that, our defense is effectively maxed out. Technically speaking, we still take, I think, half damage because of the shield ring. But hey, uh, defense, uh, maxed out defense, feels good to see. Oh, I also just realized, I forgot to mention something, I believe last time even, because my gold is maxed out. I think I did that last time. When you are playing the game on Steam and you max out your gold at Quintuple Nine, you get an achievement. Uh, as long as you're going for the bestiary entries as well, you're likely to get that one along the way, unless you're just spending a lot of time spending money for some reason on excess stuff. Not that I would see a reason for you to do that, but I, I guess there's theoretically a way for you to do that. Also, because I haven't mentioned it in a little bit, the Darm Tower's music is really good. 
Uh, I want to say the music tracks change roughly every like seven, eight floors or so. Every single one of them is a hit. Uh, Ease One's soundtrack in general is really good, but the Darm Tower stuff is easily the best. And those enemies there are the hardest in the game. You're going to want the timer ring for them rather than the shield ring just so you can actually bump into them in a consistent enough manner. Because they hurt. But you want to go through the hole they opened in order to find the strongest sword in the game, the Flame Sword, just to make taking them out for your bestiary notes just that little more effective. Again, if you're playing along or playing through the game for your first time, I really recommend you save regularly because sometimes they'll just throw enemies at you like that out of nowhere, like that, in a way that can seem kind of unfair to a first-timer. As you can see, they still really hurt, though. Uh, also, just to talk about it really quickly. Uh, the blue amulet. That effectively acts as a key on the upcoming floor. It doesn't actively call out that it gets used, but it allows you to open the door at the end of floor 21 here. Now, I should note, the final two normal enemies in the game are on this floor. So, assuming you didn't miss one of the bestiary notes earlier in the game before the Tower of Darm, or you stupidly forgot to check the stats carefully enough earlier with the Stellanorgs, like I will do in a moment, and go back and get them, killing both of the normal enemies on this floor, the Bordishes and the Knights, 26 times shall give you the final normal bestiary note, and that will give you an achievement. Boss fights do not count for that. The boss fights, I think, you get an achievement for beating them, period. So at this point, if you did things correctly, you should have numbers 1 through 36 of the normal bestiary completely filled out. And on page 4, which is just the boss fights, you should have bosses 1 through 5. So combined, you should have 41 out of 43 total entries. The final two are coming up here pretty quick, though. In fact, here's number one of those two right now, albeit it is two different enemies. This is Yoglix and Omelgun. The way this fight works is that both heads will bounce around like the DVD logo very slowly. Obviously, the projectiles around them will hurt you, but you can also only damage the yellow head, which is Omelgun. However, whenever you hit them, they switch places automatically, so you do need to kind of go back and forth. What kind of makes this fight a little weird, though, is that it actually gets easier the further into the fight you get, because the amount of projectiles surrounding the heads reduces the lower their health gets. Which is a little weird. I mean, I guess you are physically making them weaker because you're beating them to death, but it always felt like that should have probably maybe been the reverse of how it worked. Now, if you're like me and haven't been using your heal potions too much throughout the area, don't feel bad about using one here in the case you actually need to, because in the case you didn't pick them up in the chests earlier, you could just go back and grab the ones that you potentially ignored like I did. In fact, on my first playthrough, that's exactly what I did here because I did take a few too many stupid hits in this particular fight because I was trying to figure out which one I actually needed to damage first, and it took me a few moments to figure out I could only hit the yellow one. Ultimately, though, arguably the easiest boss in the game besides the centipede. And thus, the mirror shatters, and all that awaits is the final climb. This next room is just four stairways in a row, and it takes you to the final boss. But before we go in, equip the entire silver set of armor in whichever ring you're most comfortable with, and I'd recommend saving as well, of course. I'll talk about why you need the silver equipment in a few moments. Well now, you must be the swordsman dear Rhea spoke of. Your efforts to acquire the Books of Ease have been truly impressive. I salute you. But in unlocking the secrets contained therein, you have brought my plan full circle. Upon your death here today, the name of Dark Fact shall be seared into the pages of history. When the six books are gathered, a great power shall be revealed. But sadly, you are not fated to see it. And likely, that's true. So Dark Fact's a little bit of a bullet hell, as you can see. The way this fight's actively working is that Dark Fact bounces around just like the previous boss fight, like a DVD logo, and you need to intercept him on his path. But every time you hit him, a square of the floor gets taken out, and there's cases where that can prevent you from moving anywhere substantial, and you can easily get trapped by the bullets and get killed that way. But also, his bullets are extraordinarily fast, and if you're looking carefully, you might notice something. I'm moving faster vertically on the whole than I am horizontally. You remember how, I believe it was during the abandoned mine, but it may have been like the lower levels of Selman Shrine, I mentioned that there was a frame rate bug. Dark Fact has the worst instance of this because your speed gets impacted horizontally. But also the bullets just get fired a lot more quickly. So the best way to go and fix that is to go into the game's PC configuration settings. 
First thing you want to do, set the refresh rate from 144 hertz, in the case you're on a higher hertz monitor, down to 60. And you also maybe want to disable V-Sync, because I've seen that apparently cause some issues as well. Even just reducing the frame rate is enough to make the fight easier, but this is a really rough fight. Earlier versions of the game have an easier final boss on the whole for a couple of reasons. For one thing, the bullets weren't fired nearly as often. In fact, on lower frame rates, they fire less and less often, which makes them easier to dodge. But also on earlier versions of the game, for one thing, you could do more damage to Dark Fact outright because of how the game's stats worked back then versus how they work in this version. But easily, the biggest difference is that the blocks that got destroyed whenever you attack Dark Fact could only happen in a set grid. In this game, they can happen even on intervals between the main squares, meaning you can easily just cut off your access very quickly. That fight is rough, and in my experience on the newest versions of the game, it always will be. Adol found the last Book of Ease in the folds of Dark Fact's cape. The final Book of Ease has been obtained. Well, we've read numbers 1 through 5. Let's get that monocle on and read Book 6. The Book of Fact. Suddenly, in the new light of the rising sun, his siege stopped. Wherefore it happened, no one knows even now. But there was rejoicing, for it meant the end of our suffering. To ensure that he should never return, we have sealed away the power of ease. It lies within the six books, and will be given to one who collects them all, so that he may become a guide and lead us to peace. But heed ye who read these words. Those who use the powers of demons shall one day be consumed by them. The prosperity held within is a lie. It is he who leads that shapes the form of evil. All that is, jewel and adamant alike, is a treasure of ease, as given us by our merciful goddesses. When Adol held all six books, a powerful white light filled his vision, and a great feeling of serenity overtook him. morning sun began to rise. Gradually, the sky brightened, and the tower's outline began to shimmer like a mirage. As if freed from captivity, birds began to sing, and the demons dissolved into air. Adol felt the weight of a long journey lift from his heart. The world was at peace. It was as though the historic bounty of ease had been laid before him to fill his eyes and soul. As the things written in the books vanished, one by one, the shapes of the goddesses began to materialize. Though their faces were unfamiliar, Adol felt in some way that he had always known them. As he looked down upon the earth, he could see Jaba's house, quiet and humble. He wondered if Fina's memory had come back. He decided that when he returned, he would immediately tell her of all that he had seen. A dazzling light, seemingly from all sides at once, bathed Adol in radiance. He felt certain that it must be wishing him peace and good fortune. And so, Adol began a new journey. So some of you might be wondering why that ending feels a little weird. Well, there's a reason the game is Ease 1 and 2 Chronicles Plus on this credit screen. Ease 1 and 2 are two halves of one story. Ease 2 picks up exactly where Ease 1 ends off. Falcom is a big fan of doing little duologies within their stuff. Dragon Slayer, Legend of Heroes even was that. Trails in the Sky started as that. Crossbell is that. Trails of Cold Seal on its own even is two of those at once. 
It does seem a little weird in some regards, but playing them years after the fact on release, it actively does make for a pretty comfortable experience because you get the first game that will set up a lot of stuff and the second game that will actually execute and deliver on a lot of stuff in satisfying ways without making the first game feel empty still, which is actually, I think, pretty impressive because not many game companies can actively do that. As for Ease 1 on its own, it's a little uneven in its pacing and difficulty curve, but at the end of the day, it's like even the modern versions of it are relatively faithful to a almost 40-year-old PC RPG that got ported to a lot of consoles after the fact. It's clunky, but it's not that long, and if you can get through this one, the immediate improvements that Ease 2 has are so clear, and the series is so fun to follow along chronologically because of that. I think this version's really good, but to compare even the original versions of Ease 1 to, like, their contemporaries at the time with Dragon Quest 1 and Final Fantasy 1, I'd still say they came out pretty satisfying in terms of being an action RPG at the time with very limited controls. Ease 1, at the end of the day, is a game that is more important for its historical significance than the game itself, though. If Bump Combat, or specifically Ease 1, doesn't jive with you, I really recommend trying out Ease 2, Oath and Felghana, Memories of Celseta, or E7 at the moment, or I'd say the games you should really try out. Uh, I haven't played 8 or 9 myself yet, and 10's coming out sometime this year, I think, so I need to try and get through those as fast as I can so I can be ready for that one. But from what friends who have played 8 and 9 have told me, it's still a really good time, so hey, get into it, it's probably going to be fun for you. I really recommend Falcom games in general, there's very few I would say are actively bad. And even then, some of the ones that are are sometimes because they were outsourced to other companies at the time, but I'll talk more about that when we eventually reach the Ease 4 trilogy, so to speak. Speaking of which, and I forget if I actually talked about this already in the LP, the way we're going to be handling this series is in numerical order mostly. Remakes in Ease Origin are going to be handled a little bit differently with that, so we're going to go like Ease 1, 2, Wanderers from Ease, then it's Remake Oath and Felghana, then like one playthrough of Ease Origin because there's three different characters, then one of the Ease 4, Another playthrough of Origin, another East 4, the final playthrough of Origin, the final East 4, then move on numerically from there. Because that way, we sort of get the information flow that Falcom feeds us with the lore correctly in the order that's intended, because they're not quite in chronological order numerically, so to speak, in-universe, which is a whole different bag of words we'll get into when we eventually come back to the series. But with that, I'm going to need to end this LP off here. Thank you guys for watching, have a great night, take care. And I'll see you guys next Let's Play, whatever that may be. See you guys then.